Welcome to the Cube's coverage of KubeCon EU 2024, live from Paris, France. Join hosts Savannah Peterson, Dustin Kirkland, and Rob Strache as they interview some of the brightest minds in cloud native computing. Coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con is brought to you by Red Hat, CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. The Cube's coverage of KubeCon EU 2024 begins right now. Good afternoon, nerd fam, and welcome back to Paris, France. We're here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, with three days of coverage here on theCUBE. My name's Savannah Peterson, and I am really excited about our next guest. In fact, I would not be sitting here in this chair if it wasn't for the fabulous Neil Creswell. Neil, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. Thanks for having me. This is like a fun family reunion for <laughs> us. I love it. I know, I, I love, love it. it. I love it, too. Uh, obviously, you're with Portainer. You've been to KubeCon a lot of times. Five? Yeah, this is my fifth as well. Was your first, our first together in LA? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh wow, how pretty cute. Good. Wow, we're just, we're pretty cute. Uh, lots has changed, both for Portainer as well as I think for this ecosystem and collaborators. I want to get into that a little bit. How is this show different than some of the other shows you've been to? Well, for a start, it's massive. It is, biggest everywhere. one ever. I can't believe that you, you're shoulder to shoulder, you're queuing deep to, to speak to people. Yes, I, salespeople you mentioned to me people. earlier, which I, is wild. I'm seeing people eight at a booth, eight deep, queuing to see a salesperson. That's unheard of. Yeah. So, I, so there's a lot of people. Um, the personas here are seen quite different as well. You, know, like, you mentioned you talked to Kelsey Hightower about that a bit. Yeah. I think KubeCon historically has been very engineering centric. There's a bunch yes. of engineering practitioners and engineering leaders coming here to understand what's new with the technology. Now it seems to be very much more the architecture leaders, you know, platform engineering leaders who are coming here to say, I need to build a platform, what's the composition of my platform? And mm -hmm. they're coming here to make a decision as opposed to just researching a bunch of tech. So that I, think, I think the persona's changing a lot. Yeah, I think I think it is, and I think I think the ecosystem has matured a lot too since we were first coming. I feel like yeah. I mean, Kubernetes is everywhere now. It's still very confusing. Like, it, I, I couldn't imagine how daunting it is if, if if you're a company and you're looking to get started with containers. Yeah. And you're deciding that Kubernetes is how you want to get started. How do you make the decision of which of these vendors to back? Yeah, you know, we, we've seen some big name vendors unfortunately fold. That's a great point. Neil. In the last yeah. six months, vendors who you would have never have imagined have folded have folded. How walking walking these halls? How do you decide which one you're going to stake your your platform on? That's a daunting task. I, I think it is a daunting task. How would you advise people do that? Oh my goodness! Uh, so with Portainer, our our view is is. You know, don't do that. Our view is have one tool that has all the capability you need, and that way. But you know, arguably, then that's putting your, all your eggs in one basket. So, um, it's 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 a tricky answer. It really is. Um, yeah. In the, in the open source world, you know, open source. Unfortunately, companies do come and go, or projects come and go. Absolutely. So you know, you really, I suppose, you really want to say, well, how well funded are they? Um, what's their revenue growth like? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the people like? What's the management like? What's their adoption like? And try and figure all this out and build a map. It's confusing. Yeah, it, it definitely is confusing. What does the open source community mean to Portainer? I know you're, I always used to describe you as a community first CEO. What, is, what does open source crew mean to you? So purely functionally, it is an awesome way to get your product in the hands of as many people as humanly possible without any barriers, without them having yeah. to reveal their identity. Right. It's a way for people to get a lot of hands-on experience with the product. For those that love it, spread the word. For those that don't love it, spread the word. Right. Um, I've, I've said for a long time that the people who dislike our product from the community are our, are our biggest asset because they tell me what we're doing wrong and what we need to fix to get, to get better in the future, right? So a lot of people take negative or, or take, take criticism badly. Yeah. I mean, I, I do take it personally because I love my product and my company, but I, I take that, that criticism as, well, this is something we need to improve if we want to get better. So, but so for me, open source is a very, very good way to get people using your product, to get the feedback on what you need to do to get better, yeah. to understand where the gaps are in your product, um, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, I just want to give you a pat on the back there. I know you personally sit on those calls with the community as CEO. You do a lot of that interfacing. 
Talk about I direct on access. Twitter, I'm in Reddit, yeah. I'm on Slack. I, you, you, you try and get me out of it. I spend, yeah. a lot, I spend a lot of time on planes and hotels and alone. And all that alone time, I'm in social media engaging with the community. Yeah, no, I, I've always really admired that about you. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and, and, it, and it has driven the, the product roadmap quite, quite a significant amount. Oh, so much. Yeah, what's the latest from Portainer? We actually just released the new version. Uh, we, we actually moved to a short-term support and long-term support model. And this was basically off the back of customer feedback saying, we're, we're becoming significantly more adopted in large enterprises and large enterprises move slower and they couldn't handle an open source release cycle where we release fast release often. They couldn't right. handle it. And so we said, okay, right, fine. We'll break it in half and we'll release two or three maximum long-term supported stable releases in the market and we'll release short-term support much more, you know, much faster, and so Clever. iterate, 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 and then every so often we'll put a, put a stake in the ground and say, okay, everything that's been released up until now, we'll go do deep regression and release it as a long-term support. So this, we just yeah. released a version two days ago. It is the first short-term support. There's a bunch of new features, hundreds of new bug fixes, and it's really exciting because- It is exciting. It, it, it's a whole new way of releasing for us. Yeah, and, and, and so how do, you, how do you prioritize resources with those two pipelines? Well, so the only difference between long-term support and short-term support is QA. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So we, we, when, we, when we put the stake in the ground, we say, okay, everything that's, that's made it until now now goes through deep regression testing. Mm -hmm. So it's a QA resource, not a dev resource, so. Oh yeah, cool, all right. So we had, we had Priyanka on earlier this week and we've had a lot of folks chiming in on this. I want your hot take. Is Kubernetes having its Linux moment? I think Kubernetes has reached the point of mainstream. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously with Portainer, our, our customer type or our ideal customer persona is more mainstream businesses than, than deep engineering led organizations. And we have seen a dramatic pickup in an in inbound inquiry for our product. Now, that's, that's just the market maturing. And the companies that are hitting us up, they're not what I would consider tech innovators, they're everyday businesses. And so that to me indicates that it's now reached that mainstream Ubiquity. Yeah, and so yeah. normal companies, not tech innovators, are now saying, let's normal go. Normal companies, yeah. I love that, yeah. Yeah, I love that. All right, let's talk about that a little bit more. You touch a lot of different verticals and customers with Portainer. I remember a lot of fun instances that you and I uncovered, robotics and a whole bunch of stuff. What, what are some of the trends you're seeing across verticals beyond that ubiquitous adoption? Because it doesn't have to be about Kubernetes either. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm seeing, especially now, is there's a lot of companies out there who would have preferred to have remained, not in the past, but remained where they were on virtual machines. It was, IT was easy, you didn't, you didn't really have any major challenge. It was just easy, because we've done it for years and we know what we're doing. Yeah. And they weren't really wanting to make a move to containerization. There was no real motivating factor. Mm -hmm. The problem is, Kubernetes and containers in general is such a revolutionary change for people who make software, ISVs or internal DevOps, it's such a revolution. Every ISV now ships as containers. Yeah. So if you are yeah. procuring software, the ability for you to ignore containers now is zero. I was going to say impossible. Because your vendors yeah. are, are now saying, we're, we're no longer shipping a virtual appliance, we're now shipping a Helm chart or a Docker image or a Compose file. You can't ignore it. You, you, have, to, you have to go there, right? Um, so there's that angle. The second angle is, the VMware yeah. challenges. I'd be yep. careful what I say there, VMware challenges. <laughs> and you can say anything you want. And there's, there's a lot of people now saying, okay, we need to, we want to get off this and onto something new. And there, there, whatever, you, whatever, you're, whatever you want to believe to move off VMware virtualization and onto another virtualization platform, you're up for a big amount of, of services, right? right? A big amount. Now, why in your right mind would you go and spend hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of hours migrating from one virtualization layer to another? You haven't moved forward, you've moved sideways and you spent time and money. So yes. this is another forcing factor that says, well actually, let's move from VMs to containers, let's, let's use those hundreds or thousands of hours and actually move forwards, not sideways. So I think I think there there are, there are two there are two levers being pulled concurrently, yeah. which is basically forcing this rapid maturing of the technology. 
I think it's really interesting. So it's got to be kind of a moment for you. You must be, you must be feeling, yeah. <laughs> that, cheek, that cheeky grin tells me everything I need to know. We, well, we're now, what, eight years in? It's about time. Well, and, and we, when we started talking, I mean, it was something like only 15% of companies had even really thought out their container management strategy. I, I would imagine it's a lot more than that now. I can't wait to see the next survey of the market, but, yeah. but you know, when, you, when you're getting everyday companies, manufacturers and automotive companies and everything else, these are the guys who you'd say are slightly more laggard than others. Mm -hmm. Now that they're doing this technology or embracing this technology, it really has matured. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the next two years are going to be telling, and I think, I think you're going to see that mass pick up now. I agree. Um, I, think, I think we've reached that point where you get that dog leg in adoption, and, and we, we see the huge pick up in the next two years. My hot take. Your hot take. I think, I think you're right. I'll, I'll validate that hot take. I'll, I'll plus one that. I'm curious, so, I mean, Portainer is used by so many different companies. Are there any use cases lately that have surprised or excited you that you can share publicly? Automotive is, is interesting. Yeah. Um, there's, and I think, I think Tesla changed the game with their over-the-air updates and being able to push new features to vehicles That's on demand. Point. And I, I, think, I think a lot of people have woken up and said, well, actually, we need to do more of this. And so I think, I think we're going to see more and more automotive companies saying, well, actually, the in-car entertainment or the vehicle control system or other things are going to be container-driven. Yeah. Um, IoT, it's kind of... It's kind of struggled for a while. You know, you were still seeing the cloud providers I totally on agree. again, off again, on again, off again on IoT, and I think IoT is also having its moment now. Yeah. Um, just because, again, all the vendors are shipping now with containers, and if you want containers on your devices, well, you need a container runtime there, and so how hey. do you control that when you've got thousands of devices? Yeah. You've got to have it got a management tool set. So you do. So IoT, I think, is, I think it's having its moment as well. So automotive IoT is interesting. The the indi right. the industry for adoption of containers. Also, is skyrocketing. The number of manufacturers looking to get better efficiency out of their plant and material and people. There's so much cool stuff happening. So much cool there stuff. There really is some cool stuff happening. AI has been a big topic of conversation. Lots of hype. How is that entering into your world? Do you think it's overhyped? Where? What do you? I want your hot take here on this one too. So we just turned on an API chatbot in our documentation. Right now, Fortana, we invest really heavily in our, our, our doco and our academy. What we what we found though was people's willingness to go and search documentation is not there. They would much rather yeah. ask they'd much rather ask a question than go find the answer in the documentation. So even though we've got this amazing documentation that probably answers 90% of the questions, they still ask them. And so putting a chatbot in that is able to front all our documentation, our hit rate from AI to answering community questions, support questions is exceedingly high, right? And I'm I like, imagine. my goodness, that's amazing. So now we want to put yeah. that rather than just being on the website or in the documentation, we want that in-app. Yeah. But also the questions people are asking are not necessarily Portainer questions, they're how do I get this application running? Right. And I think the ability to provide really specific guidance to how to get your application running through AI is going to unlock even more mainstream use of this technology. So again, there's already two levers, now there's the third one, yeah. which says it's actually going to get dramatically easier because you can ask it questions and it will give you a lot of data automation. So, it's probably yeah. a really simple way of using AI, and I know there's a lot more advanced uses of it, but. Red Hat talked about the exact same thing. I, I, I would give you more credit than that, because it's all about increasing, decreasing developer Friction. cognitive load, and increasing productivity. I mean, everybody wants to do more, and, and if you meet your community where they are, when they have that question, and they have that struggle, and you can provide the right guidance, that's, that's extremely valuable. Well, so also, it, if, you, if you look at the, the spread of technical capability across the world and developers, right, they're, not everyone is, is, is equal, right? Not everyone is right. equal, right? That, that's reality. This has a way of normalizing things. Yeah, it, it normalizes out the curve and says, actually, though, those who need a bit more help can actually be given the guidance they need without having to admit they don't know the answer. Yeah. They, can, they can ask anonymously and they'll get a lot of guidance and it really helps them with education and remove, again, removes a barrier to adoption of this new technology. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any of the CNCF projects that you are particularly excited about? Is it Caverno? I think is how you pronounce it. Perhaps. Oh, we'll go with your we'll go with your pronunciation. I quite like it. Um, the ability to to centrally control policy and governance, I think, is quite interesting. Um, what, one of the biggest challenges when you get yeah. when you get to Kubernetes at scale is how how do you centralize your policies and controls and governance and make sure that you don't have any weaknesses or backdoors yeah. or holes yeah, yeah. In, your, in your security posture. 
and I quite like this, this ability to define a policy once and push it at the environment, so I quite like that. Yeah. So that's, that's something that we're, we're very interested in as well. I, I can imagine there's a little bit of overlap. I can, yeah, see, why, I, I can see why you like that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. What do you hope when I have you on the show next that you can say that you can't say today? I know you just got an ex exciting new announcement and whatnot, but next KubeCon, what do you want to be able to tell me? Rapid adoption to, to the masses. Again, we, we've seen it's at least a three times increase in, in, in inbound interest. If that continues, the inbound interest will be off the charts. I see no reason for it to stop based on the market dynamics. So if, if that's the case, that to me says that this is now a completely unstoppable force and, yeah. and it's, it's crossed that magic threshold to being a technology that's with us forever and mass adoption. It, it'll have its, its VMware moment where mm -hmm. it's everywhere, ubiquitous, and that would be amazing. Well, I look forward to having that conversation in Salt Lake. Neil, thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you for hiring me originally and bringing me to my first KubeCon. I am so grateful. Great fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. We had a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun every city we end up meeting each other in. I've seen you all over the world at this point now. And if you remember, that, that, was, that was right in the peak of COVID, and I think there were more sponsors than there were attendees because everyone was too scared of getting sick. A hundred percent. I remember, and we were all masked. Remember all yeah, the protocol? Yeah, all masked, and we, we had the bracelets on that said, says, oh, yeah. Stay, stay back and <laughs> that's right. It was the, weird, the weirdest experience ever. That was a very franken conference, and I, and it, and it really does. You know, we've noticed it here today. Over twelve thousand people, biggest KubeCon ever. It feels, and I don't want to jinx it, but it feels like the before times a little bit. It feels yeah. like we're back. It feels like oh, the community is super stoked. Hundred percent. Yeah. Well, anyway, this has been a blast. I can't wait for our next chat and and to talk more about the ubiquity. And thank all of you for tuning in to our fabulous coverage here in Paris at KubeCon Cloud Native Con. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching the Cube, the leading source for enterprise tech coverage.